Thank you, Emily. Uh, and I'd also like to thank uh, Dean Cassandra Rincones uh, for uh, making this possible and to Dr. John Barr for just being a, a, an incredibly gracious uh, host. And I'd also like to thank all of you for being here in the audience tonight. I know you have many choices of what to see and what to do uh, during a busy semester. So thank you for coming out this evening. Now, uh, you know, I do a lot. My main line of work is really in literary history of uh, Latinos and Mexican Americans in particular. But over the past five years, I've gotten involved with a public history project uh, called Refusing to Forget with four bona fide historians. Now, I uh, got involved with this because the, first off, I didn't know about these events uh, until I got to graduate school. And I didn't know about them even though I grew up where they had occurred less than a century before. Um, and you'll see why, you know, it's pretty astonishing that I didn't know. The other reason was because really the events that I didn't know about nonetheless shaped the context for my family, right? For my gr grandparents, for my parents, and for myself as, you know, we lived in the valley, in the lower Rio Grande Valley of South Texas. By the way, uh, anybody here from that part of Texas by any chance? You never know. Oh, yes, <laughs> Dean uh, Rincones is from Westlaco. Uh, I am from Brownsville, and I'll uh, show, you, show you where these places are on the map and why that's important. But for now, I really wanted to, uh, I wanted to help bring back to public consciousness uh, these series of events that occurred a century ago, and as we'll learn, uh, a century really is not very long ago. You know, we like to think, oh God, a century, that's ancient history, but it really isn't if you think about it in familial terms. You know, think of your, which of your, you know, maybe great grandparents uh, was alive at this time and experiencing the world of 1919. And uh, you'll see that in familial terms, well, it's really, really not that far off. So uh, I'll go ahead and start with uh, a kind of synopsis, an overview of the, my presentation today. Um, first off, I'll be talking about the period from 1910 to 1920 uh, along the Texas-Mexico border uh, in South Texas as it was a site of very intense state and state-sanctioned violence against uh, Texas Mexicans, uh, Mexican nationals, and basically generally ethnic Mexicans or people of Mexican descent. Uh, because in, the, uh, in those days, not much difference existed for many people between those categories. Um, this violence, as I've already suggested, had incredibly far-reaching consequences, political, so social, uh, economic, and even ecological consequences for this part of South Texas. And the reason why we don't know about it speaks something to the way that there's been an erasure or a suppression of this history in our Texas history books, right? The Texas history that you took in fourth grade, in seventh grade, or even in college, right? Often does not tell the story. And what are the consequences of that story going untold? So this is the part of Texas that we're talking about. Uh, the part called the Nueces Strip. Basically, if you run a line from Corpus Christi to Laredo down to Brownsville, right there, this rough triangle um, is where we're talking about. And why is this important? Well, if you took a look at basically this piece of land that was uh, known as the Nueces Strip, uh, the land between the Nueces River and the Rio Grande, 
was in fact the cause of uh, the US-Mexican War of 1846 through 48, right? That war started out as a boundary dispute. Uh, Mexico said the boundary was the Nueces River. The US said it was the Rio Grande or the uh, Rio Bravo as it was known in Mexico. Well, uh, actually Mexico had the better historical claim to it because this part, the Nueces Strip, had never been part of the Spanish and then Mexican province of Texas. Uh, under Spain, it was part of the province of Nuevo Santander, and then later, uh, under Mexico, it was part of the state of Tamaulipas. But that war changed uh, the matter entirely at it, with the Treaty of Guadalupe Hidalgo in 1848, and settled the uh, boundary as the Rio Grande. So now what's really, really interesting about this is that unlike in the rest of the annexed ter territories, right, if you recall, as a result of that war, uh, the US uh, annexed essentially Mexico's northern half uh, of the states of California, uh, Nevada, Colorado, Arizona, Nuevo Mexico, uh, so on. Uh, what we call the U.S. Southwest was essentially Mexico's northern half. And of course, the Nueces Strip. Now, unlike in those other parts where uh, U.S. sovereignty meant a pretty fairly rapid change in the uh, uh, economies and politics of those regions, this part of South Texas remained quite unchanged for a long time. So let's talk about the social world of the borderlands, or at least of the lower Rio Grande Valley, uh, right up through the turn of the, of, into the 20th century. Um, essentially, yes, there was a change in national sovereignty, uh, but, but in a lot of ways, things stayed the same. And what do I mean by that? Um, well, since it was so isolated from the rest of the United States, uh, only a few, relatively few uh, uh, Anglo-Americans ventured this far south. And those who did tended to marry into Mexican, elite Mexican families along the border. That is, they learned Spanish, they became Catholic, and otherwise, became part of the social fabric. Uh, they became Mexicanized, in other words. Now, uh, just to tell you, give you a sense of how things didn't change, really, you know, yes, you paid your taxes in dollars, but you paid for your groceries in pesos. You know, English was the official language of government, but everybody spoke Spanish. And when you talked about the capital, you meant de Efe, not DC. So really, this part of Mexico, or this part of the United States, really acted as if it were still part of Mexico, because that's how its culture, its politics, and its economy were plugged into northern Mexico much more than they were into the United States. So really, um, uh, in 1900, uh, the, even the folks there, you know, they knew they were in the U.S., but they really considered their home to be Mexico. Now, this started to change on July 4th, 1904. Uh, well, uh, what happens is that the St. Louis, Brownsville, and Mexico railroad line is completed to Brownsville from Corpus Christi. And so essentially, if you think about it, it plugs in the economy or this region into uh, the rest of the United States, right? Now there's a rail link that facilitates economic transactions and the flow of goods and people north and south. Uh, whereas before, you know, it was a kind of arduous truck to get down there. But now you could have a quick trip um, for both people and goods. And so, <coughs> all of a sudden, 
uh, in, the, uh, in the words of the railroad companies of that time that advertised the lower Rio Grande Valley to the rest of the United States, it was like California and Florida rolled into one, right? That there was this huge opportunity for uh, uh, farming, essentially, uh, down in the lower Rio Grande Valley. Well, uh, let me ask a question. Have any of y'all been to the valley? By any chance, a few folks. Okay. Well, as you know, it's it's an agricultural landscape uh, in many parts, but in other parts, if you pass through, you know, the brush country between San Antonio and Raymondville, say, or Edinburgh, you know that you know it's really dry brush country. I mean, it was called the Wild Horse Desert for a reason. That's because it was really a semi-desert, and the only uh, arable land were uh, small-scale uh, agriculture along the banks of the Rio Grande. And in other words, it's like in Texas, the saying goes that water is more precious than oil. And uh, this was true in South Texas where, because it was so dry, the only sustainable economic activity was cattle ranching. So. Along with the railroad, though, there was something else that came, and that was irrigation pumping technology, right? Infrastructure and technology. So all of a sudden, what's worthless dry land when irrigated becomes incredibly valuable for crops, right? For cash crops. And with a transportation system to get it up north, what you have is a cash bonanza, right? But you buy the land cheap because it has no water, install uh, irrigation and uh, clear the land, and all of a sudden you've got this incredibly uh, rich opportunity for agriculture. So, um, okay, well as we know, uh, a good business uh, doesn't, uh, good transport, transport business doesn't run empty containers at any time. So if goods are going north, what's coming south? For the railroads, this was people, right? And so the railroads attracted lots of folks from uh, what we call the Midwest, right? Uh, and the upper Midwest to come down to the valley uh, to buy cheap land, to get into corporate, uh, corporate agribusiness, and to get wealthy. They weren't really going down there to kind of work the land themselves, though. They were looking, a, a big component of the advertising was the fact that there was cheap Mexican labor, right? Very cheap Mexican labor to work the land and to uh, get the profits off of it. The problem, of course, is all this land is already owned by the folks who live there and uh, because of Spanish and Mexican land grants uh, called uh, porciones. And so the best lands, uh, or the lands that are most suitable, are owned by the, the Tejano uh, uh, landowners. And um, this meant that there was, had to be a displacement of not only one economy, that is ranching, by another one, uh, agriculture, uh, but also of the people that are associated with both of those activities, right? And in this case, it was the displacement of the Texas Mexican landowners by the Anglo newcomers who were farmers. Now, this took, and, and, uh, and folks came from the Midwest in, in large numbers. That's the other thing. Unlike the previous migrations to the area, uh, which were very small scale, there were substantial numbers of folks coming from the Midwest who also brought with them their uh, politics, you know, this is the progressive era, recall, and then also their racial practices, that is Jim Crow, right? Racial segregation is the kind of order of things where they come from and they see, they don't see why it should be any different uh, when dealing with the, the Tejano landowners. So uh, very quickly, uh, there's a consolidation of power, a shift in power uh, in, in economics. Uh, you know, ranch land was bought cheap and then converted into 
irrigated farmland, thus causing skyrocketing uh, land prices. Think of it as a form of large-scale land gentrification. You know, gent gentrification has been in the news a lot, but essentially, you know, if your neighbor <laughs> makes significant improvements, the land value rises, which means your taxes rise, even if your base of income does not. So hence, this was a type of gentrification that occurred that helped displace uh, the Tejano landowners who remained ranchers. Um, there's, in politics, well, uh, the uh, newcomers switched to a whites-only Democratic primary. Now, if you remember, this is uh, Texas's yellow dog Democrat country at this time. That is, you know, a yellow dog would get elected if the dog were a Democrat. So this meant that the Tejanos are getting uh, uh, essentially barred from meaningful political participation as well. And finally, uh, racial segregation comes to public accommodations, right? That is, of course, the Hanos were not segregated, right? There was always the segregation of class, of course, but not racial segregation. And so all of a sudden, the uh, Tejano Mexican descent folks in the valley who were used to running things, who were used to going where they wanted, who were used to having a say in the matters of the, of the valley, found themselves shut out. This occurred very quickly. And uh, I mean, within the course of a generation, so that, you know, somebody, if somebody if, uh, if a Mexican land, Texas Mexican landowner of this era had, you know, been put into suspended anim animation in 1900 or slept Rip Van Winkle style for 20 years, when he, he or she woke up, they would not recognize the place they grew up in. That's how drastic these changes were. We also have to remember that there's a little something called the Mexican Revolution going on at this time. And uh, this, of course, was of immense importance to the folks of the valley, not only because of the proximity, right, physical proximity, but because, of course, they were plugged into Mexican politics, right? They knew who all the players were. And in fact, oftentimes, they were sending arms and money to their preferred faction in the revolution. So, uh, and of course, they're hearing about all the revolutionary plans uh, that all the factions are issuing at this time. Um, now, as we know, as a consequence of the revolution, there are nearly a million uh, war refugees. These, these are not economic migrants. The, they are war refugees who come north as a result of the revolution. Uh, and this is the first significant wave of Mexican uh, movement to the United States in the 20th century. Uh, the other thing is that, of course, um, with the, no central, uh, central Mexican authority control, it controls the border, right? It's piecemeal when it's controlled by one faction or another, which means that all kinds of things are getting smuggled across the border. Um, you know, arms, but also ideas, right? These revolutionary plans. And uh, one of these uh, was a manifesto called El Plan de San Diego, which was issued not San Diego, Cal California, uh, San Diego, Texas. There's a little uh, town uh, somewhat near Corpus Christi uh, where the, the authorities found a plan that called for a, a synchronized uprising by uh, a, a multi-ethnic, multi-racial uprising, not only by uh, Texas Mexicans, but by Native Americans, by uh, Japanese Americans, by African Americans, that called for the uh, execution of all Anglo males over the age of 16. Now, of course, this was never, nothing ever came of it, but it certainly scared 
uh, uh, the authorities of the area in a major way and sort of set the stage with the idea that there was an impending race war that was about to explode. And explode it did, but it wasn't a race war. Rather, it was a guerrilla uprising by Texas Mexican landowners, right, who were finding them th sent themselves displaced from their social posi positioning. So it wasn't about, it wasn't, uh, it wasn't explicitly, as it were, about yeah, you know, killing white people, but that's what the, uh, the, the economics of it were, as I've already explained. Um, so you have to imagine there is guerrilla warfare in South Texas. There's a guerrilla uprising. And this is real, real stuff. I mean, there are groups, you have to imagine groups of, say, about maybe two, three dozen uh, horseback mounted uh, ranchers with hunting rifles, you know, 30 30s, you know, going out and having firefights with detachments of the US Army um, out in the brush mainly. And so uh, there's a real shooting war, right? And uh, this group was known as Los Sediciosos or the Seditious Ones. And um, this began in the summer of 1915, right? In the middle of the revolution. Remember, uh, the First World War has already started in Europe. And there were all these concerns about the potential for Germany to draw Mexico into the First World War on their side. So there's a lot of uh, 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 just incredible concern about this as perhaps being something related to all of that. In any case, it was serious uh, because Los Sediciosos raided farms uh, and uh, sometimes killing the farmers, sometimes damaging uh, uh, the irrigation equipment and automobiles, sometimes derailing and sabotaging trains. So, uh, and uh, as you can see by this very short and partial list, uh, they were hitting targets as far north as the King Ranch and uh, uh, also derailed a train outside of Brownsville, of which uh, this is a, a photo uh, taken of the, of the engine. So people are getting killed, right? Uh, and there is this general sense that it's interpreted by the Anglo-Texan population as this race war that El Plan de San Diego promised. Um, as I'm suggesting, it's not about that, it's about the economics of the situation, but nonetheless, this is the way that it's interpreted. Now, of course, the, the, uh, the uh, authorities are going to step in, right, to restore uh, order. <coughs> Uh, and this is where uh, the governor sends uh, the Texas Rangers in, and as well as the county uh, law enforcement. Um, and okay, you know, the, the guerrilla uprising, while dramatic, is very short-lived. It's over in a matter of three months, uh, in part because, uh, well, it, it, it certainly was not sustainable, but nonetheless, uh, what happens afterwards is really the heart of the story that I'm telling you today. Um, and it's known as uh, La Matanza, or the Great Massacre, the Great Killings, in the summer, beginning in the summer of 1915. Uh, and essentially what happens is that the, for the rangers and some county law enforcement and vigilantes associated with them, any, this is a race war, which meant that any Mexican was a suspect. Any Mexican was a sedicioso. Any Mexican was a bandit, and therefore uh, had to be dealt with harshly in the harshest terms possible, that is, outside the proper course of US law. So what began as an attempt to restore order, to restore peace, turns into 
the collective indiscriminate punishment of the Mexican descent population. Uh, so, and I'm going to relate uh, some, some of the like, best documented and best known of these events. Um, so, and I will talk more about the first of these in a moment, uh, uh, as you'll see. But I'll talk uh, in the September, two very well-known uh, uh, Texas Mexicans of the border of the Hidalgo County, uh, Jesus Bazan and Antonio Longoria, are shot in the back by Texas Rangers. Um, despite, this is despite the fact that they are both well-known uh, landowners in Hidalgo County uh, and in fact, even, they're, they're even, uh, uh, one of them is a county co commissioner, right? So this is not like some unknown bandit. These are well-known people uh, who get shot by the Rangers. Um, the Rangers, like I said, are indiscriminate in targeting ethnic Mexicans, particularly in the rural areas. Um, I can talk more about this in the Q&A, but there is one of the reasons why there's a bit of doubt around the historical record uh, is that the rangers are not leaving paper trails, right? Uh, they are not, as it were, creating records of the atrocities that they commit. Um, and so uh, that's one of the reasons why it's difficult to pin together uh, exact numbers, but we can talk about that later. Now, I am uh, just, you know, going to warn you that the next image is perhaps the most iconic image of this. It's also very graphic, um, and uh, uh, so, uh, I, but also necessary, but I wanted to warn you. Um, this is an image of uh, Texas Rangers with uh, four dead ethnic Mexican men, the bodies of four dead eth ethnic Mexican men uh, after the Norayas raid. And this is, uh, well, one, the Rangers were not even in the firefight at the Norayas ranch house. Uh, these men the, uh, were not, uh, none of, in fact, none of these men were in that firefight. Let me repeat, none of these men were in that fi firefight, neither the rangers nor their victims, right? Th these four men uh, just happened to be ethnic Mexican in, in the neighborhood. You know, if you think about it, the sediciosos were, were uh, rancheros. They knew, the, they knew, first of all, the reputation of the rangers towards Mexicans, and two, they knew the brush country like the back of their hand. They're not gonna be hanging around to be captured by the rangers. They disappeared into the brush. But, like I said, any Mexican was a bandit and a sedicioso, and so these four unfortunate men just happened to be in the wrong place at the wrong time uh, with the rangers. Uh, who, by the way, this photo is, uh, you know, in a certain perverse sense, extremely aesthetic. And what do I mean by that? It's extremely composed. As you can see, there are very strong diagonal lines, right, like that, that suggested, uh, uh, you know, composition, uh, that these bodies were dragged, um, and essentially is all about sending the message this is what happened to you, uh, you know, if you, uh, you know, if you at all challenge the kind of social power structure that is getting put into place at this time. Um, this, uh, I, I have a lot more to say about this photo, or I could, but uh, I do need to move on. I'll just say this image was a postcard that circulated for the next two decades throughout Texas, right? And you just have to imagine the degree to which this type of racial violence was normalized in order for that 
to make its circulation as a postcard possible, right? Just think about it. Somebody had to go to the general store, look through the postcards, pick this one out, write a message to a friend or family on the backside, put a stamp on it, mail it, have it go through the system, have it received at the end of, uh, to, by the receiver, you know, who would look at it, read the message, look at the photo, and then put it on the fridge or, you know, you know, pin it up or, you know, put it away in a drawer or something. But the thing is, is that this is the degree of racial violence that was needed and accepted as simply necessary to maintain and establish <laughs> white supremacy in South Texas at this time. So I'm just going to leave you with that. Now, in fact, the indiscriminate killings by the Rangers got so bad that the US military intervened, right? The military's are already there on the border to a certain extent because of the revolution, right? The, the troops were stationed all along the border. But instead of making things better, the Rangers were making things worse. And so the federal military intervened and 110,000 troops were stationed on the border. You know, we talk about the militarization of the border today and, you know, the spectacle of, of uh, the president sending troops down to McAllen for, you know, to string some razor wire. But we're talking about a real military occupation, right? 110,000 troops in the valley uh, with all the equipment, you know, machine guns, tanks, et cetera, et cetera, all the stuff that they are about to take to Europe for the First World War, right? They're practicing in South Texas. Um, and uh, the, this, uh, the, the presence of the military not only succeeds in, as it were, completely quashing uh, Los Sediciosos, but also <coughs> mitigating the, um, the violence that the Rangers do, right? So um, now, as I, as I mentioned earlier, uh, the rangers and vigilantes <coughs> tended not to leave records, right, of the people that they killed uh, without due process. Um, if anything, the only trace of this that you might get, well, first of all, they were doing their killings, their execution-style killings, out in the brush, right, out in the middle of nowhere, nobody could see them. Secondly, uh, if if they bothered to keep any record, it was that, uh, say, the county sheriff remanded uh, suspects to their custody for transport, uh, you know, to another town. Well, often in the record you find shot while attempting to escape. You know, that's the only trace of these sorts of killings. Um, and uh, the estimate by scholars is that we reliably have some form of documentation that a thousand, about a thousand uh, ethnic Mexicans were killed without due process, right, of any kind uh, during this, this period. Now, just for comparison, uh, other scholars have documented that approximately 547 uh, ethnic Mexicans were lynched between 1848 and 1930. So lynchings, of course, are a different category of racial violence. But nonetheless, to give you a comparison uh, with that. As I said, the, the, the idea that this was a war zone should be taken quite literally. Because this is a poster issued, uh, a recruitment poster that was issued by the US military uh, as you can see, it's already, the U.S. is already in the Second World War, or the First World War. And you can see no more men are needed for the watch on the Rhine in Germany, but 26,000 men are wanted to relieve the watch on the Rio Grande. So as you can tell, this, the idea that South Texas is a war zone 
uh, you know, I can't emphasize it more. The US military, as I said, manages to calm the situation down uh, by 1916, uh, but the violence is not quite over. Uh, and I'm going to talk also about uh, one incident uh, that is remarkable, uh, not uh, for its scale, right, at this period. And this was uh, the Porvenir massacre uh, that occurred in far west Texas, uh, you know, think uh, Big Ben country. So on, in uh, late January of uh, 1918, uh, Texas Rangers and U.S. Cavalry troops round up uh, the uh, village of Porvenir in the middle of the night. They come at 2 a.m. Um, and they uh, separate the men of the village, and we're talking about anybody older than 16, uh, from the women and children, and accuse them of harboring the raiders of a ranch uh, that's nearby, and 50 miles is nearby in West Texas. So uh, they are shot on the spot, right? They're just executed. No arrests, just shot. And their bodies are left uh, as an example. Uh, uh, their terrified families flee um, and only later return to bury them in a mass grave. Uh, this, of course, we're, we've just come up on the centennial of that event last year. And, uh, uh, I, and I can talk a bit more about that. But nonetheless, the kind of complete and utter um, disregard uh, for uh, these folks and the way that this was carried out uh, caused uh, a, a series of investigations whose centennial we're celebrating even as we speak. So 100 years ago today, in the Texas legislature, there was an investigation into the Texas Rangers' atrocities during the previous decade. Uh, and these were um, started at the insistence of the sole uh, Texas Mexican legislature in, uh, uh, in the entire legislature, uh, that is uh, State Representative uh, Jose Tomas or J.T. Canales of Brownsville. Um, he got the legislature to investigate, to hold hearings into these matters 100 years ago. And in fact, uh, we're having a, a live tweet uh, event over the next past week or so and for the next week that is on the 100th anniversary of the actual hearings of like all the proceedings of that <coughs> investigation. So what they found was that there were nearly, there were 1,500 or so pages of testimony on, on these uh, accusations of 19 charges that uh, Representative Canales brought before the legislature. And uh, there were 19, uh, 1,500 pages of eyewitness testimony to the atrocities that they committed. Now, the legacy of the investigations was mixed. On one hand, never before had the Rangers been even in danger of being held accountable in some way for their actions uh, for the violence against ethnic Mexicans. Um, that is because before that, it was just considered routine and part of the uh, uh, necessary violence needed to sustain uh, the state of Texas as it was. But, you know, using the legislative, the, the political process, uh, Texas Mexicans had begun to assert that this was no longer acceptable. On the other hand, despite 1,500 pages of testimony, no Texas Rangers were ever indicted, and in fact, much less convicted. Uh, in other words, there was still a culture of official state impunity. And in fact, and this may ring some bells, but the idea was that the Rangers uh, during this period were acting, acting under the imp 
uh, implicit understanding that the governor would pardon them if they were ever convicted. Of course, nobody thought it would ever get to that. You know, no one was even indicted, much less convicted. So, but the idea was that there was this granting of official impunity, and so that's why we call it state-sanctioned violence, right? This uh, carried out violence, carried out by state agents with the tacit support, at least tacit, if not explicit, support of the state. Well, the one thing that the, uh, that the Ranger and uh, that the Canales investigation succeeded in doing was downsizing the Ranger force drastically to one-tenth of its size uh, and then professionalized it. Um, that is, uh, you know, I can get into the details that, about that, but I think it should ring familiar in a lot of ways because, of course, these are some of the same discussions concerning police brutality that we have today. Now, let me take a look at uh, immediate consequences of all this. Well, the lower Rio Grande Valley emptied, right? Especially in the rural areas, because of course people feared for their lives. And in fact, people, ethnic Mexicans, fled to Mexico. Now, they fled to Mexico, right? Which is in the middle of a violent and bloody revolution but they felt safer there than they did in Texas. Well, the crisis accelerated the land turnover process, right? Because of course, these, these people who are fleeing are the landowners, right? And so of course, their, their uh, lands are getting taxed. They're not paying the taxes. They fall into tax sales, and so which are bought up at cheap prices. And then finally, of course, uh, there's distrust of state authorities in the uh, ethnic Mexican communities are rampant, of course, because what they see is the state are the ones attacking them, right? They're not protecting them, they're act actively killing them. Now, long-term consequences. Um, well, what happened is that, you know, you might wanna ask, uh, historians would ask, you know, why, what did this violence accomplish, right? What did this scale of violence have consequences for the long term? Well, I mean, it's clear that it's a catalyst, right? That it really kind of compresses the, uh, the, the time scale of the landowner, uh, land transition, and the economic transition, and the political transition, and the transition to white supremacy, in, in other words, in South Texas. So, uh, essentially, South Texas becomes, you know, uh, an apartheid-like state. So, as I had mentioned, an entire way of life that had existed prior to 1904 is gone by 1930, <coughs> that is, within somebody's lifetime. And so, and the new order of white supremacy in the agricultural Magic Valley becomes institutionalized well into the 1970s. That's within my lifetime. So, you know, it's not like, you know, once again, that's what I was talking about. You know, this was the world my grandparents knew. This is the world my parents grew up in. This is the world that I grew up in, even though I didn't know it. This is part of a much larger kind of uh, uh, revisiting of Texas history. Right, because for much of the 20th century, uh, the story of Texas um, is one that has been seen through the lens of racial triumphalism. This has been repeated, you know, in school curriculum and in textbooks and history books uh, for much for, for the, much of the 20th century. Um, and the counter stories, the counter histories were preserved in, not, not in institutions, but in families, right? So one of the amazing things that we've discovered is that families uh, who are dis, uh, descendants of those people who were killed at that time have built libraries, they've built archives that document not only the atrocities, but also their struggle to obtain justice because of course, the, the widows, 
filed claims against the state of Texas, against the Rangers, uh, often invoking the help of the Mexican consuls. Um, and one curious thing is that actually, when it came to, to terms of redress or seeking justice, Mexican nationals actually had more resources than US citizens. And that's because they could turn to the Mexican consuls to apply international pressure uh, onto cases to get redress. Whereas US citizens, if you were Mexican American, well, you were, you were SOL, basically. <laughs> this, this is the, the order uh, that I, the white supremacist order that characterized Texas throughout the, uh, the 20th century. And in fact, uh, you know, these are signs in San Antonio, uh, right here, the Spanish or Mexicans. And then of course, this kind of r reminds, <laughs> reminds us that uh, even though Mexican, Mexican descent people were segregated by, not, not by law, the way that African Americans were, but by custom, nonetheless, the effect was felt the same way, uh, this dehumanization. I mentioned something about, well, wh why look at something that's a hundred years ago? You know, what relevance does it have for us today? One is, as I'm suggesting, it's not that long ago. It really is not. Uh, if we look at it in terms of generational, if, generations of families, or if we're looking at it in institutional terms. You know, institutions have much longer lives than people, and they change very slowly. Um, first off, I think the resonances with today include that of law enforcement practices, right? The use of state violence to control communities of color. Uh, police brutality, right, is the kind of most recent manifestation of this. But we also see this in the kind of situation along the border in migrant detention camps uh, there. Um, and also though, the way that knowledge of these practices gets spread or not, right? Um, that is uh, uh, to changing curricula, say, uh, to teach about these incidents um, resistance commemorating or teaching the history of white supremacist violence. Uh, of course, this involves also the issue around uh, uh, adulation of the Confederacy, say. Um, and this is uh, whether or not, you know, this violence is carried out by the state or not. So the Refusing to Forget project, as I mentioned, its main goal is to bring back to public consciousness and awareness the state sanctioned violence along the border along this at this time uh, and our methods are to create and distribute resources through which the public can learn about these events um, and I'll, I'll talk about uh, some of these very briefly uh, we've uh, we have a website where we are distributing some lesson plans um, we have applied for historical markers uh, from the Texas Historical Commission to publicly document this history, and you'll see some examples of that. And then also, we have done uh, two major events in conjunction with the Bullock Texas State History Museum in Austin. One is an exhibit, Life and Death on the Border, uh, 1910 to 1920, which ran, was uh, three years ago. Uh, temporary exhibit, but over 40,000 people viewed this. Uh, history, the one that I've just related. These are the historical markers that we, that, that is refusing to forget, have helped place. So this one is just outside of Brownsville for the Matanza of 1915, which is basically a very short and condensed version of what I've just told you. This is the one for the, uh, that we are, uh, are had erected uh, this past November uh, in, uh, in Hidalgo County, for the murders of uh, Basan and Longoria that I mentioned. So uh, these are some of the folks associated with the uh, Refusing to Forget uh, team there. And uh, I'll, I'll mention them in a moment. And so we have, in conjunction with the historical markers, we've had ceremonies at the, uh, uh, for unveiling the markers themselves where we've invited descendants of those folks affected to the event uh, 
uh, to honor their ancestors and, their, and them. Um, <coughs> but we've also had like day-long uh, day symposia uh, in, at, uh, at UTRGV, right? So we had it at UTRGV in Brownsville and UTRGV in Edinburgh uh, with the two events. And this is the, the kind of program uh, that we had uh, there and all the uh, events associated with it. One of the kind of unexpected things was that uh, uh, many, many folks have responded, many students especially have responded to it with uh, creating artwork, right? Whether visual or in poetry uh, sh stories. Uh, that's something that, you know, you don't think like this is like stuff for art, but I think people do turn to art to make sense of what this means to them. And then uh, we just had uh, this conference last, <laughs> at the beginning of the month, really, as you can see, uh, which is uh, a retrospective on the Canales investigation of 1919, and which was really well attended. It was a great event. Now the folks associated with this are uh, uh, Trini Gonzalez, who's at South Texas College, uh, he, uh, he is also a descendant, uh, that is, his grandfather was murdered by the Texas Rangers. Um, Sonia Hernandez, who's a professor of history at Texas A&M, uh, Ben Johnson at Loyola University in Chicago, and uh, Monica Munoz Martinez from Brown University, uh, three of us, Trini, uh, myself, and Sonia, are from the Valley, and uh, both Ben and Monica are uh, uh, in incredible uh, colleagues and scholars. Uh, ben uh, Johnson has written the single best history of these events, and uh, uh, Monica has just come out with a book called The Injustice Never Leaves You, which is about the kind of his, the events, but also the remembrance of these events.